validity and reliability. So these two concepts are often a source of confusion. Um, there's lots of reasons for this, not least of which is because they're very often just badly understood by the people who are trying to make you understand them. Um, and this is a problem because if we can hold the two concepts separate, we can make more mileage in terms of our evaluation. So we don't want to waste the opportunities that these two concepts give us at AO2. So reasons why. Firstly, the terms sometimes treated as though they're the same, interchangeable. We call this conflation, and on the mark scheme, it's where the assessor would, the examiner would be saying, oh, well, there's a degree of confusion, or the, the answer seems muddled. And so that limits us to the bottom end of the mark scheme. Second reason is um, there's lots of applications for these terms, internal, external validity, ecological validity. We get face value, criterion value, population biases, population sampling biases, all sorts of different reasons why validity and reliability might be uh, confused together. Now, there's um, quite a few ways of trying to assess or measure validity and reliability. Um, and if you add on to that the idea that the A-level student needs um, evaluative research um, for their AO2 marks, then, well, the whole thing starts to look like a bit of a fish on a bicycle. So the fish is telling me that that's very funny, but what's the point? And the point is, as your man here is saying, a fish on a bicycle is a lot like a mule with a spinning wheel. And that's because they both illustrate the idea of invalidity. We say something is invalid when it's not appropriate to the task. So a bicycle is an invalid means of personal transport for a fish, and a mule is an invalid operator of a spinning wheel. So if, thing's about, if it's about invalid task performance, what's the task that we're trying to do when we're doing psychological research? Well, clearly, our task is sometimes about making observations taking measurements, hopefully testing hypotheses, and add it all together, we call it doing an experiment. So if those are all of our subtasks, our main task, of course, is to draw a conclusion. So if you ask the philosophers, they'll tell you that validity is a property of conclusions. So don't forget, we're drawing conclusions. A valid conclusion is one where the evidence that you've collected supports and securely supports the conclusions you're trying to draw. So here's some ways in which we can get it. So internal validity, does the data collected allow us to say anything about the original question asked? It's sometimes down to poor control of extraneous variables. So think about the schoolboy spider experiment. And if you don't know that, here it is quickly. Uh, schoolboy designed an experiment to show that spiders here with their knees. First, he placed the spider on a desk and slapped a ruler on the desktop next to the spider and observed it jump. Then he takes a pair of nail scissors and rather cruelly cuts off the spider's legs. When he slapped the ruler down a second time, the spider remained still. See, cried the schoolboy, the spider hears with its knees. Now, I think we can all see very quickly the invalidity of the schoolboy's reasoning there. He... Um, he takes away the means to register the movement when he takes away the thing that he thinks does the hearing. If he could in some way isolate the hearing function of the knees from the movement function of the knees, he could do the experiment. But he can't. Chopping the legs off not only takes away where he thinks the ears are, it also takes away the ability of the spider to register hearing a noise at all. So it's usually a matter of poor control. Um, poor control over factors influencing the dependent variable. See whether the spider jumps or not, and it makes it invalid for the schoolboy to conclude that the spider hears with its knees. Then we get criterion or test validity. Does the way we operationalize the variable actually measure what it's supposed to? So if we were looking for uh, some kind of correlation between intelligence and whatever um, academic achievement, we might use an IQ test to operationalize intelligence, but lots of people have pointed out that, of course, an IQ test doesn't necessarily test intelligence, because presumably IQ measures intelligence, then intelligence would be constant, and IQ tests, you wouldn't get better at them by practice, but of course you do. Okay, so sample validity. Does the way we put together our sample allow us to say things about the population as a whole? So. There are sample biases like self-selection or opportunity sampling, the limits of what we can do, geographical or temporal limitations, you know, we only ask our questions in one place or at one particular time, and these also restrict how far 
our conclusions can be extended or generalized to more diverse populations. Um, it's a stock critical point that we make about a lot of research is that it's, it's used as undergraduate students, especially American research, um, and how far can that sort of sampling support conclusions about the sorts of people that might work in factories on production lines or compared to, say, the, the parents of young children. Then we have ecological validity. So this is the famous one. This is does the way we gathered our data fairly represent the way subjects behave in everyday situations? Um, if you think about things like um, Ash's conformity and obedience conformity experiments, one of the criticisms that's very readily made about Ash is that nobody ever has to face a panel of conspiring, conniving so and sos who lie their heads off just to see what effect it will have on you. And so it really doesn't tell us very much about the way people work. Here's my alternative here is about the, the single digit span. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar with the Brown Peterson technique, counting backwards in threes from a very large number as a means of preventing articulation and rehearsal. So we use um, techniques to, like this to conclude what the capacity of short term memory is uh, and test recency and primacy effects and stuff like that. But the question you've got to ask is, is it a fair test? Does it really represent how human memory works in everyday life? Do, do you often find yourself counting backwards and threes from a very large number in order to prevent yourself rehearsing that vital telephone number? And the answer, of course, is no, of course not. So then I've got Mr. Skinner here saying um, he gets it now, uh, lots of different kinds of validity because there are so many different ways you can mess up drawing conclusions. But what about the reliability issue? And of course, that's an important question for Skinner because he's a methods guy. Methods are very important to him. So here's, um, here's the thing. If we used a number of different rulers and tape measures, you know, these things here, if we used all these different ways of measuring height, so we wanted to measure the height of these two guys at different heights, um, you'd expect there to be a bit of variation in the results. You know, this ruler may not be the, quite the same size as this ruler, you know, there's different variations. So we'd say that these rulers and tape measures were unreliable. Um, and these sorts of variations, they're down to the inaccuracies we find in, in any measurement instrument at all. Now, experimental scientists put lots of effort into working out how much error this kind of unreliability can cause, so we can clearly state the limits of accuracy in our measurements. And, and that's a bit like stating alpha values for inferential tests, or... Um, Limits and tolerances of error. Uh, you might have seen that if you chemistry or physics. Uh, it's all about being able to quantify your confidence in your findings. So when we're looking at unreliability, one of the things that we've got to bear in mind is um, psychologists, of course, don't use rulers, but they have other ways in which they are unreliable. Here's old Albert Bandura and his method. So um, maybe we don't use lots of rulers, but there are lots of different things we use to do all sorts of different kinds of measurements. If we were looking at questionnaires, um, the, we may not, our participants may not understand all of our items in exactly the same way. So if I say to somebody, um, how often do you see your neighbours? Um, they might say rarely and mean twice a week, and somebody else might say rarely and mean once a month. If we've got structured observations like Bandura's um, observation of participants in his ex original experiment, or here the strange situation, Ainsworth and Bell, structured observations like the strange situation are supposed to measure strange anxiety, separation anxiety, joy, reunion, and they're all things that determine attachment security. But of course, different observers won't be completely consistent. So there might be high interrate of reliability, but the fact that there's any unreliability at all is down to the fact that different observers see the thing in different ways. So um, there's supposed to be the polygraph equipment here. And we use it for measuring uh, arousal. We, we take blood pressure, galvanic skin response, how sweaty fingertips are, heart rate. And we stick a bunch of pads on your fingertips and belts around your wrists and stuff. And of course you do all of that and people immediately begin to react. And the problem with physical apparatus is that people are going to react in different ways. Um, so it's very hard to allow for. If you take somebody's blood pressure reading, it will increase blood pressure in most people. But it's hard to tell how much it's going to increase my blood pressure by relative to yours. You might not be as phased by it, you might be more freaked by it, we don't know. Uh, here's another method we use for, for gathering stuff, trait inventories to measure personalities. This Over here, this is Isenck's um, 
introvert, extrovert, and stable neurotic uh, scale, mapped curiously against what appeared to be Galenic humor theories. Um, clearly, if we use questionnaires to do this with people, they get insight. They, they begin to quite rapidly work out what the questions are getting at. And, and so you get that effect where people go, ah, you know, I understand what you're doing now, I see. You think I'm either this one or that one, introvert, extrovert, neurotic, stable. And that introduces demand characteristics. Now, if the demand characteristics all went one way, it would be easier to handle, but they don't. So sometimes people people are demanded, they experience the demand characteristic to be make themselves more socially desirable, and other people experience the demand characteristic as like, oh, I'm going to mess with your results now, the kind of, sometimes they call it the screw you attitude. Um, here's another one for you, the, the famous fMRI machine here. Or no, actually this is a CAT scanner, I think. Um, and we use these to measure brain activity in various ways. And you'd think that's pretty objective, that's fairly reliable. Um, but again, these things have to be calibrated, and they're not always calibrated to the same levels of accuracy or sensitivity. Now, those the data about accuracy and sensitivity on this machine is going to be well documented and well publicized. But the fact that it exists at all means that it's always a potential source of inconsistency and error. And you can't rule it out, not completely. So there's a bunch of uh, different ways in which we can be unreliable. So there's no completely reliable procedures or techniques for, for us. The research instruments aren't entirely reliable. We've got to work with the different sources of unreliability and try to make allowances for them. And ultimately, this is the thing, the fact that we can never completely rule out the effect of unreliable methods, that means that we've got to be cautious. We always state our conclusions with caution. We're going to minimise the potential criticisms of validity that way. You know, Somebody could come along and say, well, the, the conclusions you've drawn can't possibly be valid because the methods you've used are unreliable. If when I drew my conclusions I said, assuming that, you know, or dealing with the idea that I know my CAT scan is calibrated to sort of a 10% accuracy and the one I'm comparing it to is 15% accurate and there's a limit there because of this. That allows me to then say the conclusions that I'm drawing are limited in terms of their validity but they're not completely invalid. They still have, they retain relevance. They're still useful data even if it's not perfect. Because nothing in science is perfect, we have to be cautious. Mm -hmm.